There's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking. Just rocking. In a way that's true, if you know what I mean. Just take a look at the senior scene. Well, it's rocking. Yeah, it's rocking. We're pulling our weight, learning the code, clicking our heels, sharing the load. And every so often we're hitting the road. Yeah, we're rocking. Well, I must be going, got a game at... Carmen on the Aging Speaker Series has focused on innovations in senior housing. The popularity of senior housing is growing, and there is a need for more affordable
dining house. Well, there's a possibility that seniors wishing to downsize or reduce their costs might be interested. Also, young people just starting out may be interested. People who are transitioning from homelessness, uh, people who are just concerned about the environment. The Browns, Jerry and Teal, will be talking about the market for their tiny house. And it's not without complexity. We'll be hearing about the difference between a house constructed uh, on a foundation versus a manufactured home on wheels. And to add to that complexity, we found that it's not unusual for each town in our area and the county as well to handle the rules and the regulations related to a tiny house a little bit differently. Uh, both building code and local zoning are factors uh, in how these small houses are handled. You know, how, how much land do you need for a tiny house? Uh, are you connected to water and sewer? Is, is it a house on a foundation? So after we hear from the Browns uh, about the tiny house you saw this evening, we're going to have uh, some local uh, planning experts who will be set up uh, just outside the door, and uh, they're going to be able to give you some uh, individual one-on-one -on -one answers to questions, and the answers will differ depending on where you uh, might want to live in a tiny house, um, whether it's where you are now or where you might want to move to a tiny house. Uh, the, the rules are different in Chapel Hill and Hillsboro and Carborough, and if you're not in, uh, in one of the incorporated towns, you're in the county, the rules are different there too. So now it's time uh, for me to uh, introduce our, our speakers tonight. Wishbone Tiny Homes is a company that's out of Asheville that builds homes ranging from 120 square feet to 1,000 square feet. Uh, the business is a, a family-owned and operated general contracting company and RV manufacturer. The father-son company is looking for ways to create <coughs> small places that are functional yet attractive. Uh, Jerry's background is in uh, designing and building homes, and Teal's background is in woodworking, building science, uh, music, and management. The family business also partners with nonprofits to provide financial support, employment, and shelter to those who need it the most. So please join me in welcoming Teal and Jerry, and let's thank the Browns for bringing the tiny house for us to walk <laughs> The main reason we're here is to share our, my dad's experience building tiny homes and designing tiny homes and talking to people every day who want to live in them and buy them and design and build them themselves. So we're going to share what we've learned. Um, we don't claim to be the experts. We, we do have a lot of experience with at this point and, and some things to shed some light on. But more importantly, we're here to facilitate a conversation the kinds of conversations you're having with each other tonight, with the city officials that are here, the county officials, it's happening all over the country. Uh, just like this, people are gathering to, to look at the possibilities. Um, and it's very exciting to be uh, embarking on this, this new industry, essentially, and this new option for housing. Um, so we're here to facilitate that. And I know that there's county officials here, I think from all four counties. Um, I think that's really great. Yeah, between 
those years. Uh, my, I learned a lot from my dad early on. I took a lot of woodshop classes in my younger years, but I got into music. Uh, my parents encouraged me to follow that aspiration. I did that for a long time, played music. Um, I left that to start a family because uh, that wasn't conducive to a family life. And um, I got into uh, building sciences, so energy efficiency, energy auditing, sustainability, renewables, um, and learned a lot about that part, that aspect of the building. Um, when that kind of came to an end for me, I, I had this revelation. I really wanted to work with my dad. I wanted to start a company. I wanted us to start a company together. So I left my job and I, uh, I reached out to him. I asked him if he wanted to do this, and he was he was game. You know, he was getting ready to just wind down his other business. And I said, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you back in. And uh, and so he's been, you know, ever since he's been 100% on board and it's just been um, a real pleasure to work with him. Um, this is our a shot of our shop. Uh, this is one of the ones we're currently working on for a customer in Florida. But we are in Asheville, North Carolina. We have a 2,000 square foot warehouse that we work out of there. We do design, we do, uh, consulting work out of there, we build there, um, and apparently now we do speaking events. So uh, we do a lot of small space there, and that's what we're good at doing, is making the most of the small space. So I want to take a step back. Everybody kind of has a different definition, but let's talk about what is a tiny house? What are the definitions um, out there? And it's important to start uh, by delineating ones on wheels versus the ones on foundation. The ones on the wheels are, are what you hear about in the music lot because they're the ones that um, are very popular because you don't need a permit to actually build them. A lot of DIY folks, people who are doing it on their own, are building these uh, and finding it a very affordable housing option. Tiny house on the wheels is limited in general up to 400 square feet. So they usually range somewhere around 96 to 400 square feet. Um, Tiny houses on a foundation is a whole different matter. And this is one of my favorites that I've ever seen. I love this one. Um, they can range in size, we say, up to a thousand. It's kind of an arbitrary number. Um, but it's also, the, the, the concept of tiny goes beyond square footage. It's a concept, it's, and it's a relative concept. So if you had four people in an 800 square foot house, or and six people in a 1200 square foot house, both of those are considered tiny. Um, so it, it's all about how many people you have for square footage, in, in my opinion. Um, so we'll, it, for this presentation, we're mainly going to be talking about the ones on wheels, because those are, that's the, the friction point, especially with uh, zoning and that type of thing. Who are the founders? Uh, a lot of people were, um, cite these two as being, as being the general founders of this modern movement. Um, Sarah Suzanka wrote The Not So Big House in 1998. And Jay Shaper, who's kind of the poster boy of the whole movement, he started Tumbleweed Tiny House Company, who is the most well known company in the, in the industry, in 1999. Um, however, I'd like to submit another uh, potential founder, my dad. <laughs> he, he actually, in the 70s, was living in a geodesic dome that he built, um, a tree house that he built, and a goat shed. Um, I'll let him, if he, if he wants to elaborate on that, there's a lot of stories behind all that, but you know, in the 70s, he was really, he was building and living in tiny spaces. Um, at that time, Lloyd Kahn is another name that you probably heard out there. He's a, he's a, wrote a lot about geodesic domes and small spaces. Prior to that, going back in history, um, Henry David Thoreau. Um, Walden was written in 1854, and that's a book dedicated to simple living in 150 square feet, which is it's really what we're talking about today. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how far this goes back, and then we can keep going back to the beginning of civilization. I mean, this is not bad, but um, ever since humans started creating shelter, you know, it's been a small space, it's been a cave, it's been whatever, it, it's been small and on a human level. So um, I think it's important to notice that this is something that's always been in our nature as human beings to live in a small space or to be inclined to be in a smaller space, more human scale. And uh, I think that's what's coming back full circle these days, people realizing that 
wow, there's something that feels right about being in a smaller space that fits all my needs and nothing more. Um, there's also places like, like Japan and other denser populations that are just have to, out of sheer necessity, make a more dense option, like these hotel rooms. So, one of the most wonderful things that the Tiny House Movement has done is spawned a ton of creativity. People are just getting crazy about how to design these things and what kind of things to embellish and what to reuse. Um, I want to just look through a couple of tiny houses that I really like. Um, this is like a little garden shed, I think, that is actually probably a bed in there. Um, you can see it's got a, like a little pop-out dormer there, covered in tree, big windows. You know, aspects you can find in a larger house. That's one of the tricks of the industry of the tiny house design is, is using larger elements from a, a larger home and throwing them in a small home. This is the Minim House, one of the most popular houses on the internet. Some of you who are familiar with uh, the tiny house scene probably have seen this house. Uh, a guy named Brian built this, designed and built it. He lives in Washington, D.C. There is a community that's not a funk called Boneyard Studios. And this is right in the middle of D.C. and they were doing a pretty wild experiment up there with like an infill lot where there was three or four of these tiny houses. This one's on wheels. Um, highly functional. It's got solar, it's got rain catchment and recycling. Um, the use of space is fantastic. He's got uh, the blinds that pull down and it becomes the screen for your projector. Um, it's got holes in the floor to move a table around that's on hydraulics. It's got all sorts of options to convert the space and make the most of it. The bed is underneath that desk, that with the desk area there. So it's a great use of space um, and a lot of creativity in that. Speaking of that, this guy, Texas Tiny Homes, is one of the best artisans out there. He does, I think, 99% reclaimed materials. So he spends a lot of his time salvaging and reclaiming and using all of that to create these works of art. They're actually livable homes that he delivers. Um, and if you, if you can take notes, take note on that and go check his website out, Texas Tiny Homes, and uh, check out his work. It's really fantastic. This next one is one of my favorites. The use of the tongue of the trailer. This is the best use I've ever seen. That's a wood fire hot tub. Um, and a split level entry. So you've got a door at the top of the deck there. It goes right into the tiny home. Um, most people, we just put a shed on ours, but they just put a hot tub. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. Wheelhouse is another company. This is a, it's actually considered an RV, park model RV. Up to 400 square feet um, on a chassis. You can detach the wheels once it's there. They can be semi-permanent. Um, but I love the finishes on this for a more modern look. They've got a whole resort based on this. I'll show you some more pictures later. Home that's home in the middle. You can see it's very peaceful there. Um, this is the other, the second most popular house on the internet. Uh, Andrew and Gabriella Morrison designed and built this. They're a couple with kids. And they built this for $33,000. That's the, <coughs> and um, a lot of great use of space again. The, their stairs are storage. Um, these, they've got some side notes here you can see for eating and working. Um, and a really nice, I didn't show you here, but a kitchen that's on one end. It's just a huge kitchen for a tiny house of standard. So one of the better homes on the internet as well. Um, here's just a young couple who probably build their own tiny home. You see this all over. People are getting together their funds, trying to find a place to do it, some tools, a friend with, with knowledge, and building their own homes. And this is on wheels, and you can do that. Um, and you're seeing a lot of young couples like this really happy uh, and, and having this experience together. So I just want to show that I don't know who they are, but I know they're happy. And, and here, here is the uh, interior of um, I'll show you more later on the tiny house giant Germany. Have you ever heard of them? There are a couple that are traveling the country in their tiny home that they built. And this is the interior of that. It's a really creative use of, of everything. They reclaimed some boxes and storage and made stairs that go up there. Uh, they've got their instruments in the wall. They've got a, it, it's just a really beautiful little home with a wood stove. And the dog, and the dog goes with them. Um, Here's another creative use. It's a portable chapel. So you can actually, you know, you want that remote location, but you still you, you gotta have that, you know, you gotta have a priest there or a 
somebody there if you've got the wedding and make it a little bit more religious, you can have your chapel. Um, so I, I love that all the uses are just getting so great. And of course, food trucks. We had a food truck here today. Here's one of ours. We participated in a show called Tiny House Nation. And this was the couple. Um, they were clients of ours. And uh, midway through the design process, they said, hey, we got we got cast on this show, Tiny House Nation. Do you want to be the builder? We said, of course. So uh, when we agreed to that, we didn't know exactly what we were getting into. But it, it was um, it was a grueling and really exciting process of working with the production company and actually filming this up in New Jersey. Um, but that is uh, an off-grid home. It's, it's on. It's in the middle of that field. It's turned on. It's got solar batteries. And you can see how happy, happy they are. <laughs> Here's the interior of that one. That's just that's the kitchen. So, why are um, why is this happening? Um, besides it always being inherent as human beings, I think to live in a small space, something about the more recent tiny house movement, what we're calling the movement. Um, what is what spawned it? What's the the background story here? Um, I want to back up 65 years. That's a good round number, um, 1950 to 2015, and show you some comparisons uh, based on some numbers I pulled from the National Housing Housing Association. So we're going to look first at average salary in 1950. Anybody have a guess? Someone say two thousand dollars. Ten thousand. Okay. Well, adjusted for inflation, looking at thirty-two thousand dollars. If it weren't just for inflation, it was $3,300. But we wanted to just show how this happens here. So now, 2015, 45000 Average house size in 1950. Okay, 1200 close enough. Brother Butter, I'm going to do 1,000 square feet. Now, 2,600 square feet. It's got a lot bigger. Median house cost. So two times two, the factor is two times two of the average salary. So 2.2 times $32,000 is the average median house cost in 1950. In 2015, it's ballooned to 3.7. The average family size, this is where it gets interesting to me. In 1950, it was 3.3. Now it's 2.54. So, so what does this look like? All this information, um, what does it look like? Uh, I, didn't, I was trying to figure out the best way to depict this, and the only way I could do it was basically break down the square footage per person. So if you've got uh, a thousand, in 1950, 1,000 square feet for 3.3 people, you've got 303 square feet per person. So that's how much an average person got for the average family. In 2015, this is what it looks like now. 1,040 square feet per person. Um, so there's a lot of questions here. Well, how do we get here? Uh, I mean, other than just a booming economy, and, you know, growth, massive growth, and um, you know, an emphasis on individuality. I, I don't know, many of you who have maybe lived through that bracket might have some better input in why we got to that point, but it's a, it's an interesting trend, um, and I think it, it's a pendulum, and I think it's reached a maximum and it's swung back the other way, um, and I think there's been a couple of triggers to that. Um, one, of course, the tragic events of 9/11, coupled with the Great Recession, I think woke up a lot of trends in our society. Um, so this, we know, we all know what happened. I don't want to get into it too much, but of course, it created a lot of um, real estate that was defunct, um, a lot of foreclosures, a lot of empty lots, um, a lot of crushed markets, um, condemned housing. So there became the financial necessity to kind of revisit housing. Um, that's that's one of the reasons I think the pendulum has swung back the other way. Um, another is urban density. People are moving to cities more and more. And so cities like Asheville, as small as the city at Asheville is, it's got one of the most 
dense, uh, it's, got one, it's got a housing crisis. We've got under 1% vacancy rate there in Ashland. And, um, and so the city council is doing everything they can to, to help with that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about what, what they're doing, but um, that is a real driver too for smaller living. There's been a renewed interest in homesteading. Um, the younger generation now is really interested in living simply off the land. It's a refreshing um, change. And I think that also goes well with the tiny homes on wheels because you can take those things out there, park it on your land. If you, as long as you have your utilities covered, you can be pretty much off-grid and, uh, and live off the land. Another thing called the apple effect. Who has one of these? <laughs> um, I'll have a chance. I'm gonna take a picture of all of you guys and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on Facebook so make sure you check which one tiny one's Facebook page. So give me one second. I'm going to take this, this panoramic shot. When I go by, wave or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> Got it. So we'll put it up. So the, so the Apple effect. The Apple effect is something that I kind of point and that I keep talking about it. What these phones and these devices, these digital devices have done in our lives has got us comfortable with storing things that used to have physical space into a place they have no longer have physical space. Music, pictures, uh, anything like that, files. We're really getting comfortable with getting rid of those things and putting them in a digital space, the cloud or on your hard drive, or where, wherever it may be. Um, so simultaneously, I think Apple has changed how we view wealth. So now wealth is not having more things, it's having a cleaner, simpler surface in your life. And I think it's, tr yeah, I think it's translating to, to homes. So you, you look at these, these high-end modern homes, they have super clean lines, very little things in them. Um, I think that's the idea of wealth. And um, so Apple's kind of flipped the script that way. But more, more so, it's just got us comfortable and it's made living in a small space palatable because um, if you think of your home like a smartphone, it serves all your needs and you can, you know, you can stow away this, this cabinet there and do all this fancy, you know, dual functioning furniture. Um, I think there's, I think it kind of goes along with the smartphone concept. So I think that kind of played a role. Um, other is redefining and searching for happiness. I think people are finding that happiness is something they're finding through experience, not possessions. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, I get, I have a biased view because everybody I talk to every day wants to do this and they said, I want to get rid of all my stuff and I know that I, I, I can be happy if I have fewer things. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an amazing trend that's going on, but people are realizing that it's not about the stuff anymore. Um, so I think that's another piece of it. So what does that look like? What does the pendulum look like swung back the other way? Now, this is a 150 square foot house, and it's assuming one person is living in it. Um, now, usually people live together, so let's say it's two people in there. That's one person per 75 square feet. Um, pretty drastic change from not only 2015, but also 1950. Um, so that's the extreme other end. I think somewhere in the middle is, is realistic for most of us. Um, but let's look at a cost per person kind of analysis of this. So if we were to take in 1950, the salary, which is 32,000, times that median house cost factor 2.2 and divide it by the amount of square feet, you get $70.40 per square foot, which in this case would be $22,000 per person. In 2015, you take the salary, multiply it by the factor, and divide it by the amount of average square feet. You get a lower square foot of 6471, but that's, that makes sense because the larger you build, usually the less it is per square foot. Um, but this is where it hits you if you realize how much more it is per person. That's, that's more than three times the cost as it was in 1950 per person to own a home. Today, it, with a tiny house, Let's just call it $35,000 for an average do-it-yourself tiny house um, that's 150 square feet. So that's a high cost per square foot, that's normal. 
the smaller you build, the higher it is per square foot. But then you're looking at 17,475 per person. So clearly there's a, a cost advantage to going this route. <clears throat> Same thing with energy. For that space, for one person, 6,000 BTU to heat and cool that space. 16,800 BTUs to heat and cool that space. And then the tiny home, you're looking around 3,000 BTU on average to heat and cool 150 square foot space. Who is doing this? I know JD touched on this. Um, and I, I totally agree with what she's saying. Millennials, uh, we get a lot of calls from the millennial generation folks who are just out of college, uh, or planning to be just about out of college and want to own a home. They don't want to rent. Rent is exorbitant, especially in Asheville. Cities like this, we're looking at crazy rent because of the density issue. Um, you've got people saddled with a lot of student debt. Student debt is going to be the next bubble, I think. Um, and they see that too, and I think they're trying to get ahead of that and make smart moves and do one of these tiny homes. Here's Jen and Guillaume, the folks that I was talking about that are that hit the road and with their dog in their house. Um, this is a perfect example. They, this is how they're making their living right now. They're blogging about it, they're doing workshops, they're doing tours all around the country, and just living uh, out of their tiny house. Another application, the homeless or the otherwise uh, disadvantaged. Um, we work with uh, one of the organizations we work with is called Veterans Helping Veterans of Western North Carolina. And so we hire through them. And we also train them, uh, the vets who are coming in, to go back to their location. And actually, the goal is to have them pay these for transitional use um, for vets who are homeless or who are back you know, from, from overseas looking for a place to settle and, and a way to get on their feet. Um, so it's a really good application for people who need it as a transition. Um, here's an example of Madison, Wisconsin, that's made a big splash in the news um, for the homeless. They uh, occupied Madison and actually really spearheaded this thing and uh, have now, you can see all the homes behind them, um, built these homes and, and that the homeless are actually helping them build them. Um, so there was a huge um, back and forth with the city, of course, over a year of back and forth to, to get this to work. Because as, as you can imagine, utilities present a challenge um, when there's a home on wheels and it's not permanently attached to a foundation. It's challenging for a city official to understand how, how do we make this work. Anyway, they did here in this case. Investors also have a place in this. They, they see it for these eco-resorts. Like this one, Fireside Resort in uh, Jackson Hole. You've got an amazing um, it's a resort. You can go and stay there in your own little 400 square foot place. So investors are interested in professionals who want office space. Uh, I don't know if you guys recognize that. <laughs> That's the house outside. Um, and we are getting ready to drop it off tomorrow on the way back to someone who's going to be renting it as an office space. They've got a boat business in Asheville, um, and they're going to be doing tours along the river, and this is where they're going to be kind of receiving their, their customers. Um, so there's tons of people interested in this. Transient workers. Um, in North Dakota, oil fields in North Dakota, here's, here's just a little snapshot. If you, if you go up by Google Earth and look at oil fields, of, oil fields of North Dakota, you're going to see rows and rows and rows and rows, and rows of RVs, trailers, you know, hotels. I can't put up hotels quick enough. This is one, one solution, one option. Also, seniors. Um, turns out uh, seniors are quite interested in this. And um, here's an example, one Betty Presley, I guess she's 72, and she got her tiny home, and look how happy she is. <laughs> um, another reason we know seniors are interested in it is because AARP did an article, and when you know they did it, you know it's official. So tiny houses are becoming a big deal. Do you guys recognize that house on the left? Yeah. We didn't know that was going to be happen to be in there and um, that's, that's our house. Um, so it's clearly becoming more of a, a consideration, one form of it or another a consideration for um, the aging community. Why not? Why wouldn't we go forward with this? Why wouldn't we be able to do this more? Um, that's why. <laughs> the toilet is a huge topic of discussion. I can't 
can't tell you how much we talk about toilets <laughs> in this issue. It, it's amazing. Um, because you have to have a normal toilet permanently connected for it to be considered um, legal. Um, and also people are just used to this. When we start talking about composting toilets, incinerating toilets, you know, bio toilets, dry flush toilets, all these other options, it, it gets a little daunting, a little, um, little messy for people. But that's, that's not the biggest load. Um, really, the biggest challenge is right now, the first one is finding land, especially for the ones on wheels. Every customer who calls, who's looking to do this series, has said, take care of that first. If you can get the land piece figured out, where you're going to put this thing, because they're not, it's basically considered an RV. And if you own an RV, you know you're not supposed to live in that RV. Some people do, of course. Um, but you can't call it a permanent house, a permanent dwelling. Um, so finding a place to put the tiny home is a huge challenge, even if it's on land. Um, foundation, sorry. If it's on foundation, there's, a, there's other challenges, but not as many. Um, so the utility connections are, are very difficult to deal with. If you're on a remote piece of land, you know, just still have to get power and water to the home and deal with your gray water uh, responsibly. So these are all conversations that we need to have with city officials to to understand what are the options. Um, let's think outside the box a little bit and, and understand how we can work together with, for example, a composting toilet, which if done properly can be extremely sanitary. Um, so another challenge is finding. Um, these are very unconventional homes and uh, banks don't consider them homes actually. And if you say I'm making a tiny home on wheels, they, they don't know what you mean. So, you have to either get cash, personal loans, lines of credit, um, equity from another home. You have to go non-traditional on that. Um, so that is, that's very difficult. And finding a new construction loan for a tiny home on foundation can even be challenging if it's of similar value to the land itself. The banks have this risk analysis and they don't, they don't like that. Um, so there are all sorts of challenges with finance. Insurance is also a challenge. Uh, and if it's a tiny home on wheels, you know, basically considered an RV, uh, most insurers are not going to, you can't say you're living in it because that would be considered a home. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, navigating the rules you have to figure out with insurance. It, it's very sticky. And so it, it's a new industry. So there's, there's no conventions yet. We're still establishing all this practicality. I know a lot of people in there that say, oh, this is neat, but I could, there's no way I can do it. Um, Keep in mind, first of all, we build them a lot bigger than that as well. But uh, what about Thanksgiving dinner? Um, <laughs> you know, the practical side of things, or your heirlooms, or those things that are important you can't part with. So there, there's some flips there on the practical side, which are understandable. And of course, building codes and, uh, and zoning, which we mentioned, um, can be, they are the biggest hurdle right now. So let's look at some, some positive sides and developments in, in regulation um, that we've noted. We started a group or helped start a group called Asheville Shack or Small Home Advocacy Committee. And it may be worth considering, um, I mean, we've got four counties here, but uh, getting together and forming a committee of some sort to, to help. Um, what we do is foster and you know, support for other people looking to do their projects. Um, we're trying to lay some trails and you know, getting, a, getting a zoning variance, for example, something like that, we can be out there championing for them. So how this is playing out across the country is generally um, getting zoning variances for communities so you can group these things. Um, in Asheville, near Asheville, we have a place called Village of Wildflowers, which is actually a great little community. It's a, an RV park that they've kind of converted. Um, and they sell plots to you, and there's a little pond, and you can take your tiny house and plug it right in there, and it's what you because it's zoned as an RV. Um, there's also um, those homeless communities that I was talking about, there's one in Madison, there's one in Austin, uh, Texas. They're popping up a lot all over the country. So communities are a really good way to go because it groups, groups them, and that way the zoning variance can be for a specific plot of land instead of this patchwork, you know, an exception for me, an exception for this person. If you group them, it's easier to, to work with the city on that. 
Accessory dwelling units, or ADUs, uh, are also a really great solution for city density. Um, Portland is big on this, Asheville is really big on this, and very supportive. We're doing one right now, this is 335 square feet. It's in the backyard of a primary, and um, it's, it's completely permitted. Um, we have everything you need. So that is a really good solution, and that's one, one example of how a city can make some exceptions our county can make some exceptions to the minimum square foot requirements. Micro parks in more dense urban areas like New York City, Washington, D.C., they just changed New York City a minimum square foot requirement. So you can now build below 400 square feet per apartment. And that has allowed a lot of people who, for a growing single population, which New York City has, allowed a lot of people more housing opportunities there. Lastly, North Carolina House Bill 625, which was voted um, October 1st, 2014. And I think it was just, uh, there was a local vote on it yesterday, I think. I, I don't know the outcome of all that, but it's a very promising little piece of legislation that um, it allows for temporary health, family health care structures. Um, and if, if you look at what they're looking for, they're looking for primarily assembled offsite. One occupant has to be either mentally or physically impaired. So if it's a caretaker, the caretaker is in the primary, and one being cared for is in the auxiliary. Um, 300 square foot max, that's perfect for us. Um, and then applicable state building codes. Um, that's a little vague. What are, which ones are applicable? I don't, I'm not, we're not sure. I think that's something that everyone's going to be sifting through. Um, and also cannot be on permanent foundation. So that kind of fits what we're talking about out here. The version, it's not this house out here per se, but there is a version, and I think my dad's going to show you in his portion what that would look like. On the note, I want to pass the mic over to my dad, my business partner, um, and introduce him. He's been uh, an amazing uh, partner in all of this, and. Um, he, he, I've never seen him work as hard as he's been working with with me on this. And so uh, I'd like to invite him up here to uh, to share some things with you guys. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to speak at length here. And um, please welcome Jerry Brown.
requiring a lot of things. Uh, had to do with um, living in a way, consuming in a way that you know was was, was concerned about the environment. And it had to do with the feeling that debt uh, was the enemy of uh, personal freedom. The recklessness that I talked about, the rejection of uh, status quo was indiscriminate. We, we threw out enough babies with the bathwater to populate another whole baby. <laughs> At any rate, when Teal asked me to, to be a part of this, I was moved. I, you know, I thought about it for about three seconds <laughs> and pivoted. And just got into it. We don't have to do it. And as you said, I, I've never worked hard. <laughs> Retirement is one of those perks of survival that I'm not looking at anytime soon. <laughs> I would like to talk some of the values that kind of drive this phenomenon, sort of the human component uh, about affordability, and uh, share with you some old and new um, options that are available out there in the marketplace for aging and community, for aging in place. Governments, the local, non-local governments have been clamoring for affordable housing forever with, with mixed results. Uh, my opinion is that the uh, solutions we've come up with are, are less than ideal. They, to me, they lack imagination. They are either institutional or flimsy. So it's been difficult to find a combination of affordability and any kind of quality. And by quality, I mean that sort of a, a sense of home, a coziness or a hominess. Uh, that's been hard to achieve. So it is an unfortunate reality in construction that um, the smaller you get in a project, the higher the cost per square foot. It's just a natural law. That's hard to avoid. Um, and this is always hamstrung the effort at uh, achieving affordability. The cost of materials, is uh, fairly constant and then rising. The cost of labor is fairly constant, unfortunately not rising enough. At the, it's certainly not as much as the cost of materials. The cost of land, of course, is always rising. So how do you achieve affordability with, with that reality out there? It's very hard to do that with this quality that I'm talking about. <clears throat> If you continue to build at the scale and size houses that we've become accustomed to, you're going to have to compromise on workmanship or material. Some, somewhere, you've got, something's got to give. So it wasn't until somebody came up with the idea of radically, drastically reducing the uh, footprint, the square footage of a, of a house, that um, enough so that you get to the other side of that equation, that economy of scale that says as things get smaller, they cost more per square foot. By drastic reduction, I mean, I'm talking about uh, as much as 90% or more, going from this average that Teal talked about of 2,600 square feet to 200 square feet. It's, it, is, uh, it is drastic. And it, it's, it's the metric, it's the standard that really catches people's attention. Um, and the media right now is in a frenzy about this. Of course, we see this because we're in the industry, but uh, we get calls every week from a newspaper somewhere, a radio station. Um, the media is all over this. Now, we don't think that's going to last. Media frenzies don't last. Phenomenal things going to last. A lot of people look at this at first blush, and the idea of living in 200 or 180 square feet uh, seems preposterous. And I think this is the the piece that the media is so interested in because it seems so ridiculous um, at first blush, uh, so absurd. Uh, when you run the numbers and uh, when you see what the numbers represent, uh, for example, a mortgage term or a loan term of five to 10 years as opposed to 20 to 30 years, a monthly payment that is manageable, or even if, you, if you're lucky enough to have owned some property, building an entire house out of the equity a lot of what we see in, uh, in terms of financing options. On top of that, they're just so freaking adorable. <laughs> <laughs> it's irresistible. <laughs> People find they can live with a trade-off. It's a trade-off of space uh, for some financial freedom, personal freedom. And when they, when they do that, when they make that decision and cross that line, 
What looks really preposterous then is living in a 2,600 square foot house where you're buried under a mountain of debt, where all you can do is work at a job to pay your bills. That's what seems preposterous. So that's sort of some of the some of the sort of human sort of calculation that's going on with Armstrong. You get manageability, easy maintenance, sustainability, convenience. You have a home that's built with uh, attention to detail, care, craftsmanship materials that you couldn't get anywhere else. When we start to uh, work on a design with a new customer, we have a rather extensive design interview. We sit down and we ask a lot of questions. We ask people to measure their spice jars. We ask them to sort through their clothing and, and prioritize. We ask them, um, we ask them, here's the important one, we ask them, what is it that you own that you absolutely can't contemplate letting go of? And we get interesting answers to that. In one case, it was a piano. <laughs> in two cases, it was a knight in armor. <laughs> must stay. Must find a place for a knight. This is really good information for us. It gives us uh, uh, gives us something to begin to organize and design around. It also gives us some insight into what that person believes is important. Very helpful information. About this point in the conversation, it gets starts getting interesting because we start getting into some lifestyle questions. And values questions. We, we want to know what prompted them, what on earth prompted them to consider uh, moving into a space the size of an average dining room. And uh, this is what we hear. We hear, we decided that uh, quality of life was more important than uh, acquiring a lot of things. We hear, we want to live in a way where our impact on the environment is less and we're not having quite a footprint. And we hear, boy, that we would love to be out of debt. Because it would, it would mean we would be free to do, devote to more time to stuff that means more to us, like our relationships, or we're spending time outside, whatever it is. So we, we see a, a, a diverse group of people. But if you were to demographically generalize, we see a lot of people see the same age. The millennials, that you mentioned before, we see a lot of people my age, boomers, who are um, uh, on the threshold of retirement and looking for options. Um, the millennials are looking to break into home ownership, which has become increasingly difficult as the, the income disparity grows. Um, they're looking to get into home ownership responsibly, sustainably, and uh, so that's what's bringing them to us. The wiki entry, in fact, on the, um, uh, the wiki entry on millennials and millennial gener generation had another term for them called, uh, called echo boomers. And uh, because their arrival sort of was signaled by a the mini birth, the uh, uh, rise of birth rate. So I think there's more of an echo than that. And, uh, and I'm very heartened by that. They seem to have achieved this uh, the same sort of constellation of values that I'm raised young person, um, but with, without the reckless misguided parts. <laughs> and with a, uh, with a very keen and inventive entrepreneurial strength. It's very, very, my, my, my son here is a good example of that. So this is the, um, is the first time you have the two and I built. We did this about 14 years ago. He was halfway through college, wanted to take a break, and um, so I took the time off. And we spent about nine months building this little cottage in our backyard. And we had a ball. We, I wanted to see the experience of getting a building out of the ground. You know, so we dug the footing, we poured the concrete, we did the block work. Uh, we framed it, we did the whole thing. And it was nice, because like we were having a rough day, we would just walk to an afternoon movie or something like that. Um, we had a lot of fun, fun doing it. Um, it's about 400 square feet. Uh, it is set in a very nice, mature Japanese garden. This corner looks down into the uh, koi pond. Uh, my wife and I have lived in it at times, and our, our, our thought was this is something that um, when our family is here, we'll, they have a place to stay, or they can have some privacy. But the long range uh, goal was uh, if we needed assistance, a caretaker, a care person uh, could live there 
Or um, we could move out there and live a little more simply, and we could rent our house. So that's, this, was, this was sort of our attempt at a, uh, an elder cottage. So it's not novel. It's not new. This is an example of an Amish uh, practice called the Rose Body House or Grandfather House. And uh, this would be situated very close to the um, primary house and the elderly uh, grandparents would live there. If they had close access, they would have some autonomy. And um, uh, so this, and they've been doing this for years. In 1961, interestingly, uh, the IRS announced that Amish would be exempt from paying Social Security tax because um, they don't accept Social Security. Uh, it's against their religion. Um, any kind of insurance is against their religion. So the government saw that and they agreed with that. Uh, so uh, some other companies have put up similar ideas. This is one called Echo Cottages, uh, Elder Cottage Housing Opportunity. And uh, these are uh, pre these are manufactured homes that are designed to be put into place when there is a need for the care of an elder uh, family member. Again, they have the autonomy of having a place of their own. Uh, it's all ADA compliant so that they're the, um, the it's wheelchair navigable, uh, the, you know, the roll-in shower and that kind of thing. All those, those things that go away from the bottom of the face. These are, uh, these are in the, um, 450 square foot, generally about 12 by 38. Uh, the price for these is about $50,000. Yeah, here's the Echo Cottage uh, uh, layout. Uh, the living area, uh, bathroom, very accessible bathroom, uh, bedroom, small little kitchen area. This is called Med Cottage, and it's a similar idea. Um, this, is, this is more like a portable hospital room. Uh, there's monitoring there, there is, you can have uh, uh, all sorts of monitoring equipment installed. You have remote monitoring so that the family members uh, in the house can kind of keep uh, at least a gear to what's going on out there during any emergencies. These are on wheels, and, um, and these are, these range from about 300 to 600 square feet, and the uh, cost range on these is about forty to $60,000. $40,000 for the unit and then transportation and delivery and uh, installation. There, uh, you know, just a view of one on the wheels. It happens to be this particular house, which is the, called the uh, tiny house on the trail, which is out in Pendleton, California. And um, you can see the ramp that they've installed for that. Uh, this is uh, 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 the same idea, about $100,000 installed. So it's a little bit larger. So these are all options that fall under this guideline that uh, of the legislation that we've been talking about. Which is the inside of the um, little house on the little house on the trailer. Now this is something that it, you know appeals to us. It's a little more along our style. Uh, the blue sky design. This is about 450 square feet. It's on foundation, and it is uh, totally ADA compliant. And now this house is probably going to run, you know, their, their product run between forty-five and hundred thousand dollars. Uh, they're pretty fabricated. Uh, they do sell, sell uh, their plans for this design, uh, and it's a very clever design. Uh, I don't know if you, do we have a picture of the interior? Yeah, here's the floor. So you want, you come right into a nice living area. The out, kitchen alcove allows plenty of room for dining in the, in the living area there. Uh, it goes right into the uh, bedroom, so like a, a studio apartment, right into the bedroom. Um, there's a bathroom there too, again, accessible, wheelchair accessible, uh, very simple, straightforward, accessible design. All of these options have their place, uh, and they fill the need in the marketplace from subsidized housing to mobile homes to elder cottages to upscale retirements. Uh, our hope is to see more options that are affordable, sustainable, beautiful and offer a quality of life that fosters dignity and pride of ownership. We have a mic, so if you would uh, come to the mic to ask your question, that would be helpful. What is the square footage of the tiny house outside? 
So if you count the loft, which tiny house people do, it's 170 square feet. I'm not very into building things, and I'm a little confused about hookups and the water and the composting. Could you be a little more specific about that? For tiny homes on wheels, it can vary depending on where you are. This one out here, basically for water, you're going to connect an RV hose. It looks like a garden hose. Um, in the warmer months, in the cooler months, you'll fill up a tank that's inside so that water hose doesn't freeze. Power is a power cord. It looks like a like an extension cord. Um, gray water is dealt with locally. So we have a tank on board there that you could actually fill it with and it mostly people find a responsible way to dig a leach field for the gray water. That's your shower and sink water. If you're using biodegradable materials, it's, it's safe. However, that's where you run into some issues with uh, zoning. Um, you used the word sustainable on a number of occasions and I would like you to clarify you what is sustainable about tiny homes? I mean they're a building, right? Well, I think sustainable, sustainability is a word we throw around a lot. Um, so it's sustainable in the sense that you're, the amount of materials you're using is limited. Oftentimes the materials you're using are reclaimed or reused. We did a lot on this one that are actually uh, reused wood. Um, your footprint on the environment is a more sustainable one in that you're using less coal from the fire from the coal plant or whatever you get your electricity from the grid because you're just taking less out of it. Um, it's sustainable in that way. Um, do you have other ways it's sustainable? Yeah, I, I think there's a state sustainable sustainability in the, in the finances involved with this. Um, I think that if you were if you were to switch it around and discuss what's not sustainable, what doesn't seem sustainable to me is the sort of ever increasing um, rate of consumption and, uh, you know, again, this whole issue of acquiring things. And so this is a, this is a movement toward uh, less acquisition and uh, simpler living, and uh, which um, actually sets aside more of your resources, your financial resources, to devote toward something else or uh, it's more sustainable in that you're not um, working, spending your entire working life uh, paying off debt. The latter, because a lot of seniors can handle it and a few will not be able to. And so one of the things that I think about is a possibility, it's not a criticism, but something that might be developed is, so I've repelled off cliffs in the High Sierra. So could you make something like a seat that would make a safer up and down? So I think of this as a, a, a cottage in the backyard for a, an aging parent. And if there were something to get up and down that, I would feel much safer about having them there. Most of our houses actually, we use stairs to get up there. Um, it was, was storage underneath. But in reality, a lot of what we do is build the bedroom on the first floor. So there's no going upstairs if you don't have to. And you send the, the grandkids or the kids up there or push put storage. But it's a great question. You know, and, and the whole ADA compliance thing, there's just a ton of as a world to explore and Brian Brunson, where's Brunson here? He's he's an expert in that field and I can't wait to talk to him about it more, but there's just a million options that we could do potentially who knows what's possible with lifts and that yeah. type of thing. But thank you. When you built your cottage um, on your own land, did you hook into the uh, septic and the water that was already there? Were there any zoning issues or building permissions or that? There, there were no issues with that. It was a fully permitted legal structure. And you did for you? Yes, did everybody hear that? She's wondering if, if, every, if the, the 400 square foot cottage was connected to the utilities in a legal way. And, um, it was. Uh, so we, we permitted and inspected that whole process through the city of Asheville like you would any other build. Could you have actually dug a well there if you wish to? Would that have been possible? I don't. I don't know. I don't think that that would have been, um, you'd still need a permit to, to build a well, to dig a well. So what you're in the city limits too. So it's just, it just just makes sense to tap into the city's supply. Most of the jurisdictions in our area, if you're in the urban services area, and uh, so if you're in the city limits, they're going to require that you connect to water and sewer. They might let you have a well for watering or something, but for most,
they do sort of an Amish shell where you build the basically the walls and sell it like that so that we can do the interior ourselves? We do. We, we build a partial, we call it a partial build um, to any varying levels of completion. So we can, that's the one we saw in one of the first pictures that we're working on. That's, that's that shell or a partial build. We're building the uh, framing, siding, trim, insulation, rough in electrical and plumbing, roofing the windows, and then we hand it over to the homeowner to finish on their own, their own time. Cool. And then the second part is I was just in Asheville last weekend, and because my kid is going to go to UNCA, I'll be there again in June for orientation. Do you offer tours of your facility? Yes, absolutely. We, we always invite people to come. We'd love to schedule something. So reach out to us and we'll schedule it. For the houses that you're hooking up to, normal utilities, such as the 400 square foot, in order to call that an occupancy, is there a minimum square footage? Yes, we found the minimum square footage in North Carolina. If you, it's not clear if you go to the North Carolina code book, but if you interpret it in such a way, you can get away with about 240 square feet. The primary single family dwelling unit. Um, you have to package it correctly and present it to the inspector and the plan review members correctly. But there's a way to do it. It's been done in Asheville. There's a there's a house that's a standalone. House 240 square feet. I just wanted to thank everyone for being here and also wanted to mention that our local government representatives are in uh, just outside the door, or they will be in just a minute. Um, Ashley Mercado from Hills, uh, from Orange County, is here representing uh, for those who live in the county, and Tom King is here from Hillsborough Planning. Uh, Tom, well, thank you. And Gene Oromo is here from Chapel Hill. He's there raising his hand. And uh, Trish McGuire is here from Carborough uh, as well. So uh, wanted to thank our, our local government. One of the things we hope to do is spark some pioneers who want to try some of these new things. And we're aware of at least three uh, groups in our audience who are committed to the small house concept. And they will also be outside at a table and willing to talk with you. Peter Bohenick is here in the back. Jason Hart, an architect. And Ariel Schechter, who is committed to um, small house design as well. So we're fortunate to have them with us, and they will um, be happy to talk with you after we finish tonight. So I think we have a lot to think about, and we have a lot of gratitude to express to Teal and to his father, Jerry. And so, a round of applause for him. There's a myth going around town that when you get older, you just sit down and start rocking. Just rocking. In a way that's true, if you know what I mean. Just take a look at the senior scene. Well, it's rocking. Yeah, it's rocking. We're pulling our weight, learning the code, clicking our heels, sharing the load. And every so often we're hitting the road. Yeah, we're rocking. Well, I must be going, got a game at three. Then kids to be tutored, they're counting on me. It's a brand new century, and we're rocking.